Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about how you can implement and work with threads in Java. And I think this will be very helpful for your second mini project. So a little bit of an overview about threads, threads in Java, talk about some of the issues with synchronization, and then just a little bit of an example of a multi-threaded server, which I'm going to adapt in a couple of lectures' time to show you how you can have a multi-user online uh, game. Okay, threads in Java. <coughs> so threads are um, just a sequence of instructions, really. It's executed on a single processor or processor core. And in, a, in each thread, um, there's like a list of instructions, and the first instruction is executed first, then the second, then the third. The instructions are executed in, in a determinate order. So one instruction has to be completed before the next one can be started. So, uh, you know, we have the simple TCP client stuff, uh, previous lecture. So, you know, the, if this is a thread, then the thread will do that, it'll do that, it'll do that, and it can't do this until it's done that. Everything, so if there's a blocking sort of uh, method call at some point, then the rest of the thread won't be executed until the block is, until it, the method call returns. But computers, um, computers run lots of programs, there's lots of programs at the same time, and within a program, you can run multiple threads at the same time. So you can have one thread doing the kind of graphic side and the other, another thread doing a computationally demanding task. So if you ever use JavaFX or something like that um, and you've got to like load a huge file, then if you do it in the graphics thread, what you do, what you'll find is that all the graphics just lock up and do, do absolutely nothing until the computationally demanding task is done. The much better way of doing this is to have a separate thread that does all the heavy stuff um, behind the scenes and that enables you to continue interacting with the, with the graphics. Same true is, um, and same true with like printing or file saving. You don't want the graphics to lock up while it's doing this, so you would typically run it as a separate task in a separate thread. And in the context of network programming, online games, um, you might want to use threads. Uh, you might use a sep want to use a separate thread for blocking calls, for example, waiting for a socket to connect, so that you can do other things or set the shut the server down cleanly. This sort of stuff. Now on a Threads are, from a user's, programmer's point of view, uh, they're sort of, it, it's effectively like you've got separate programming, separate processes um, that are working simultaneously. But in practice, um, you've only got a limited number of CPUs, possibly only one CPU. So if you've got it, like what, lots of spare CPUs, then you can run one thread on each CPU, and these threads will all run like in parallel in time. What happens more typically is that you have what's called time slicing, that uh, say, say these three threads are being run on a single CPU, the CPU will spend a little bit of time processing thread one, a little bit of time processing thread two, a little bit of time processing thread three, and then go back to the beginning on thread one. So it does a little bit of each of the threads, very, very fast, so it appears that all three, three threads are running in parallel, even though they're actually being run up, run in very sort of fine time slices, uh, and they're actually only running uh, in a serial fashion. But there's still no guaranteed order of execution between these things because it's which thread the processor chooses to execute next will be you know, down to scheduling and stuff. As, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So in Java, you've got two ways of running threads. You've got, um, you can create a class that implements the runnable interface and pass this class to a Java thread, which then implements it. Or you can just extend the Java thread class. So the runnable interface, so we talked about interfaces previously. Um, you just implement the interface, and the interface consists of a single method called run. And then you create a class that implements this interface and has the run method. When you pass this class to the Java thread, it knows that it's got the run method, so the Java thread will just call the run method. And, it's ex and when the thread runs, it calls the run. So here we have our class, hello runnable. It's declaring that it implements the runnable interface. And in order to implement that interface, it has to have a, uh, a public method called run. Um, and then we put whatever, so whatever happens inside the run method will be executed as a separate thread. So, so this class might have all kinds of other stuff and, you know, heaven knows what thread that's implemented in. But when we, but this is, everything inside this run method um, will be implemented when we run that, when we start the thread. Nothing else. Oh, and, and any methods that this itself calls. So we have main, so here we create the, here we create an instance of this class. We pass this instance of the class to the thread. And then we call thread.start, and then that, that starts the run method going. 
And so it, it'll call all of this within a separate thread, which in this case just outputting hello from a thread. So that's one way of doing the run method. One way of running a thread in Java. Another way is to extend the Java thread class and then implement the run method. So instead of having the interface, which is passed to a thread, which is then started, we just extend the thread class directly. And so we just say that we're extending the thread. And if we extend it, and then we override the run method within the thread and just say, you know, here's, our, here's the code that's executed in the separate thread. And then we just create an instance of that class and call start. And when we call start, everything in here and all the methods and all the rest of it will be executed as a separate thread. So which you choose to do uh, depends on your overall software architecture. In Java, you can only extend a single class. So it might turn out that you really, really, really want uh, your thread class, the, what's your run method, to be in another class that has, extends a separate class. So for whatever architectural reasons, um, that if you're extending from another class, but also want the run method to be in that same class, then you're going to have to implement the interface and use the runnable method. You've probably got a fairly weird or, you know, doesn't, you, are, you might want to take a second look at your architecture if that is the case, because, you know, most often you probably want a separate class to do all the threading stuff anyway. So, and generally extending threads is much easier to use and conceptually simple, simpler. So I personally would recommend that you just extend thread unless you've got a really overriding, compelling reason uh, for implementing Runnable. Now, one of the uh, extremely useful methods that you've got within thread is uh, this sleep method. And this pauses the execution of your thread, and you can specify how long you want the execution to pause. So this is incredibly useful, incredibly useful for lots of things. You know, I used it when I was teaching a class on uh, Twitter, downloading Twitter, because you had to wait a certain amount of time for the, uh, you had a rate limit on the number of tweets you could download, and so you could use this to sleep. I used this when I was doing programming on my agent system because it was like uh, outputting real-time MIDI data. So it needed to output a, a note and then sleep and then output the next note and sleep and output the next note. So for many, many real-time applications or, and other applications, sleep is an incredibly useful method. So it sends it to sleep. The thread's just parked by the CPU. Nothing happens to it until it wakes up. So you're specifying this uh, sleep time, but the exact time... Uh, it might not be that accurate, the sleep time, because it does depend a little bit on the operating system. It might wake it up a bit later if it's doing other things, particularly if it's running multiple threads in parallel. So I found this when I was running the, writing my music system. I found that the timing was a little bit rubbish, and one of the reasons for that you know, might have been because the sleep wasn't entirely accurate. And if it's uh, interrupted while it's sleeping, it throws this interrupted exception, and so you need to wrap this sleep in try and catch. So this is a very exa simple example. So it's, you know... It's got a for loop, does this thing five times, prints out something, then tries and catches, and all it does is sleep. So it'll print out something, go to sleep, wake up, print out something, go to sleep, wake up. Now, to run multiple threads, um, you can't start the same thread twice. Um, you can't call start on a thread class that's already running. That'll give you some kind of error. What you have to do is create separate thread classes and, run, and start those separate threads if you want to run multiple threads in your program. So I'll just sort of show you how this is done. So suppose you've got a thread class here, like hello thread, and that's got the run method that does exactly what I said, you know, prints out something, sleeps, prints out something. Now to, to run two instances, two threads doing this stuff, we can't call start twice on hello thread one. We have to have two instances of the class, hello thread one, hello thread two. We start them separately, and then we'll get our multiple threads running. So I'll just show you how this works. So as usual, um, you've got all, the, all this code on the course website for you to adapt and use. So this is our hello thread main. We're, running, we're starting these two thread classes. And then what these, th what these threads are doing are just outputting uh, hello from thread. Uh, I've given each thread an ID so you can say that it's hello from, th so these threads are, these are the IDs here. Um, these are the IDs so we can tell it's hello. So we're, given, we're saying that one thread's one, giving one thread the name one and the other thread the name two. So we just run this, um, we're getting like, you can see it's like pausing, it's, it's outputting hello from thread with the ID, then it's going to sleep, and then they're both of them waking up in sequence, outputting hello from thread, outputting hello again and going back to sleep again. Okay. 
Right, so yeah, that's the output. So they, they, out, they both output hello from the thread with their IDs, and they go to sleep. A second later, they wake up again, and you can see that the ordering is not necessarily determined. So it's one, two, two, one, one, two, two, so one, two, one, two. So it's a little bit random about which one wakes up first. Some other useful thread methods are is alive, so you can tell whether the thread's actually running. Join, so if you start lots and lots of threads um, to do certain kinds of tasks, and then you have to, then it turns out you have to do something that depends on those tasks having finished, you can call join, and that just is a blocking call that waits for the thread to finish. So I use that a few times uh, in some of the example code I'll give you. Um, when, I've, uh, when I'm trying to shut the whole system down, I want to call, tell the thread to stop, I wait for it to finish, and to do, to, and in order to wait to, for it to finish, I call join. Interrupt, so if the thread's asleep, or um, well, I'll explain the use of interrupt in, in a little bit, but you can wake it up from sleep or stop it from running. And yield is uh, if you've got lots of threads running and one thread's taking up too much of your CPU time and you want to you know, give other threads a chance, you can call yield and that will allow other threads to execute. And I'll talk about starvation, um, which is what, when you use yield. So you often, uh, if you've got a multi-threaded program, you often want to stop, stop the threads running when you want to shut the program down and do something else. Uh, so if you want to cleanly shut down your application, close the sockets, tidy everything up, you're going to have to shut down the threads probably. There's two ways of doing this. Um, you can either implement your own stop method or use the thread method interrupt, each of which has the disadvantages and advantages. So the stop method is we have a Boolean, which we add to the thread class, and a getter and setter for the Boolean. So we have like run thread could be our Boolean, and we check the Boolean from time to time and exit if it's false. So just to show you how this works, so here, here's our thread class, we're extending thread here, and this has this Boolean run thread. And in our run method, first we set the run thread to true when we start running, and we keep checking to see if this run thread's true or not. And once it's, if this is set to false, um, then we'll exit and, and the thread will uh, finish. And here we have a separate method called a stop thread, which sets run thread to false. So another class can call stop thread, and then that, when that, so this can set it to false, and, and therefore and a separate class can cause this thread to exit from this while loop. So this is just a little bit of example how you can do this. So we, here we are, we're creating our thread here, at the top, starting it running, and this is reading user input. So when I type stop, um, it sort of exits this little bit of reading input and cause stop thread to stop thread. And what that'll do is cause the, th cause the thread to stop. It, what that does is sets the Boolean there and causes this while loop to exit. Yeah, so it sets this to false um, so that the while loop exits. Okay, well, I'll give you a little bit of demo of that. So here we have stop thread main. Yep. So we've got the thread running. This is the output. So the thread itself in the while loop is just saying thread is running. And then if we type stop, um, then it causes the thread to exit. Okay, I should probably call join um, to make it you know, extra special perfect, but I didn't get around to that. Okay, so stop's nice. It's, it's like really easy. You just check to see if the Boolean's um, true or not, um, and you can mix those sort of checking of the Boolean anywhere in any of the tasks um, that the thread's doing. Disadvantage is if the thread's sleeping, then it'll only stop the thread when it wakes up from being asleep which is mostly fine, but um, that can be a disadvantage. Then we have this sort of built-in mechanism um, that can be used to stop thread called the interrupt method. And uh, so if the thread's sleeping and we call interrupt on it, it can throw an interrupt exception. But if the thread's not sleeping, it will have to manually check whether an interrupt has been received. And this is a bit like the checking of the stop um, in that while loop. There's two ways of doing this. We can call the method thread.interrupted, and this returns true if it's been interrupted. But once it's been called, it resets the interrupt after it's been checked. So you have to call, you have to call interrupt the thread again if you want to set it to true again. Or you've got this non-static method called isInterrupted, so a particular thread calls isInterrupted. It doesn't change the status of the interrupt flag and just tells you whether it's been interrupted or not. So here's how it works. So here we have uh, 
our run method, and we've got a try catch interrupted exception. And so, uh, ba, 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 ba. so while it's uh, while the thread's not interrupted, it'll output that, and then it'll go to sleep again. In this case, ten seconds. Um, and if it's interrupted while it's sleeping, it'll throw this interrupted exception, and we'll get this message thread interrupted during sleep. So, so this is nice because it'll work whether it's sleeping or not, and all we have to do is check that thread interrupted. And again, we've got the same, same thing. We've got an interrupt thread, starting it up. When it, you stop, it'll call interrupt on the thread. So I'll give you a little demo of that. Um, yeah, interrupt the thread main. So that's this class I just showed you. So there we go. So it's outputting thread is running. Oh, yes, yeah, sleeping 10 seconds now, right? So if I just type stop, it, it uh, calls the... If I type stop, in this case, it's uh, calling, it's throwing an exception because it's asleep, and it's telling it's interrupted during sleep. So this it's, it's exception is not a bad thing. It's just, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's expected behavior, and I'm handling it in the appropriate way. Now, join is used when we create a thread. We start it, and we interrupt it, and then we join it. So we should probably have done this on the threads that I've shown you. So we're telling the thread to stop, and then here we're waiting for the thread to finish um, before we exit, uh, before we move on. So this is a blocking call. Once the thread's finished, once the run method's completed, then this, this join will return, and then I can go on and do something else. Now threads have a priority level. So the Java virtual machine's running all these different threads, um, and each thread has a priority level that ranges from 1 to 10, and that's used to select which thread to run. It always runs the thread with the highest priority, and you can get the priority using get priority and set priority using set priority. Priority is handy, but it has a problem that you can get starvation. So if there's lots of high priority threads and another, and another thread with low priority, and then the, then the low priority thread uh, will never get executed because all the high priority threads will be executed, and this is called starvation. So, so this poor thread with low priority just runs, it never gets any CPU resources and never runs. And it might be important to you that this thread does run just from time to time. So in this case, you need to invoke sleep or yield on the higher priority threads so that the lower priority thread gets a bit of CPU time. Okay, so that's the basics of um, running threads in Java um, and shutting them down and some of the useful methods with them. Now I'm gonna talk about this problem of synchronization. So threads are these separate processes that are running you know, with indeterminate order of their operations. And the tricky thing is that two threads can have access to the same data structure, and they can modify that data structure at the same time. And this can leave data in an inconsistent state unless you take steps to ensure that the, data's, that the thread's access to that data is appropriately synchronized. Java has mechanisms for that. That's good. So we've got these three, three different ways we can do this. We can have synchronized methods, synchronized statements, and uh, locks. So I'm going to talk through these and give you a couple of examples. So the easiest way to do this is synchronized methods. So we have public synchronized void increment, for example. We just add this keyword synchronized um, to the method. And it's not possible for two threads to invoke the same synchronized method on the same object simultaneously. So we, ha so we have an object with a synchronized method or a number of synchronized methods, two, two separate threads. Um, one thread will get access to the object, can execute the method, but then the second thread will have to wait until the synchronized method is completed before it can gain access to the object. So suppose thread A is executing a synchronized method on object A. If thread B tries to execute a synchronized method on object A, it's going to block until thread A has finished. So it, so it controls the, um, so it prevents, yeah, multiple threads calling these synchronized methods on the same object, potentially confusing its data structures. So it explains synchronization a little bit, hopefully a little bit more clearly. Um, we'll go through this little example. So here, here we have a counter. Now this counter is the, the class that's shared between the two threads. This counter has two methods, roughly the same. Um, and what, what these two methods are doing is it's got a for loop going from naught to, one, two, three, four, six, to 100 million, and it's just increasing the count by one. So it's just a very big, it's, large number of calls to increase the count by one. And then when it's, when it's increased the counter 100 million times, 
it returns the new value. So both of these methods do the same thing. The only difference between them is that this one's synchronized, got the synchronized keyword, and this one doesn't have the synchronized keyword. Okay, that's the first. That's the that's the sh the class that sh the object that's shared between the two 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 threads. So one of these we've got a synchronized method and non-synchronized method. And what we're doing is we're uh, this is the non-synchronized thread. Um, so we're giving each each um, thread an ID, so we know, know what it's doing. We're, we're passing, we're got creating a, we, as you'll see in the main method, we're creating a single instance of this counter. We're passing that single instance of the counter to both threads, so they're storing a reference to it there, and we're giving each thread an ID. And then we've got two, two, uh, and now in the run method of the threads, um, we've got uh, some code here that's calling the non-synchronized method and some code here that's calling the synchronized method. So first thing I'm going to show you what it does when we call the non-synchronized method from two different threads. So what it's calling is this big increase with no synchronization. So both threads are calling this method. They're both manipulating this count value um, with this large number of different increases, large number of increases. So we're creating a single instance of the class counter, passing it to both the threads and starting both the threads. Both the threads are going to call the non-synchronized method on it. So I'll show you what it does. Okay, synchronous methods. So here's the thread. And yep, so we comment out second bit of code and uncomment. So I'm uncommenting the non-synchronized code here. Okay. Uh, and then this is the code that creates the counter and starts the two threads. Right, so I've run it once, um, and what the thread does, it starts in the run method, it will call the, each, so each thread will start, will call counter big increase, and the order in which they'll call that is a bit indeterminate, and they'll call it at the same time, effectively, they'll be competing to call the same method. So in this case, we've got, the output is like 104, 9, da, 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 and 110. If we run it again, we should get a different output we get a different output there. And we're getting a different output because both threads are calling this method simultaneously and then we're simultaneously modifying the counter structure, the counter object. So what we get is that in run one, we're getting you know, one set of values. Run, run two, we're getting another set of values. And run three, we're getting a different set of values. And we're getting these different values because both objects are calling the same method on the same object simultaneously, and so they're sort of increasing it. And so one, or one thread will finish the method will return while the other, while the other thread's still changing the object. And so you know, you're going to get you get this weird sort of very messy data, which is obviously completely useless if you're trying to run uh, do some proper calculations. So Java has this way of preventing this error from happening. What we can do is have a synchronized method. So I said we're calling this time the synchronized method. The only thing we've changed apart from the name of the method is the fact that we've got a synchronized keyword here. So I'll show you what happens when we call, when we call the, the method with the synchronized, the synchronized method. So what we do is we change what we're calling in the thread. We just comment out the non-synchronized method call, uncomment the synchronized method call, and then we run that. In this case, we get 1 million, 2 million. One thread calls it first, increases the counter by a million, 100 million. Then the second one calls the same object and increases the counter by 100 million, leading to 200 million being the value of the counter. We run it twice, get the same value, we get the same value each time. So, as it happens, thread one started first, so this gets exclusive access to this object now and increases it by 100 million. Then when this thread one's finished, thread two gets access to the object, and it increases, and the object already has the counter value at 100 million, so it increases it by another 100 million, leading to it having a value of 100 million. So because they're not competing for access, they're sort of synchronized together, so one gets access, another gets access, we get nice, clean, consistent results. Um, and, you know, much more effective if we're doing maths or something like that. 
So that's the, the first way in which we can do synchronization in an object. And this, this method is based on an, the idea of an intrinsic lock or a monitor lock. So each object has a lock associated with it. And the threads that, uh, if you want to, the threads that want to manipulate or change that object need to acquire that object's lock. And when one object, one thread has that object's lock, no other thread can access that, access the, or change the object um, until the first thread has released the lock. So when a thread's invoking a synchronized method, it's acquiring the lock for the object, and then it releases it when the method returns. And then another, another thread can access, a, can call a different synchronized method on the object. This doesn't apply to non, the, the locks only apply to the synchronized methods, not to the unsynchronized ones. And if you need a more fine-grained way of synchronizing threads, you probably never will because you can always break down your code into more fine-grained methods. But if, by chance, you needed a more fine-grained way of synchronizing threads, you can use what are called synchronized statements. And so the methods, uh, when, a when a thread invokes a synchronized method, it acquires the lock for that object. And synchronized statements are blocks of code that are synchronized on that object. And you specify the object um, that you're locking on. And only one thread can access the block of code at a time. Only one thread that can access the, the lock on the object. So in this case, so this is how it looks. So we've got synchronized in, in this case, um, and the keyword and the object that we're synchronizing on is this, i.e. the op, this counter class here. So we can have a statement, and then you just have like curly braces, and everything in that code will be synchronized, and multiple threads won't be able to access it simultaneously. Um, and this, in this case, is the object that we're synchronizing the lock. We're obtaining a lock on this particular object. But we could also um, have our own lock class and synchronize on the lock class. And if we had two different lock classes, and the different threads could then access different, um, the block of code with different, the different locks. Um, so we could handle this in a different way by using a, a specific lock class. The third way of synchronizing code is through this lock interface, um, which is implemented by the reentrant lock class. And we have this blocking method that acquires the, lo the lock, unlock, uh, attempts to release the lock, is locked, try lock, and so on and so forth. So this, this is how the lock class works. So we have a lock class, and we call lock.lock. .lock. Now the first thread that calls lock.lock, .lock, um, this, this method would just simply return, and then the first thread can just continue to access the code can access this bit of code in the middle, execute it, and then release the lock and return. But if one thread is already called lock.lock, .lock, then the second thread that calls this, um, this will be a blocking call. The second thread will block um, while the first thread does that, carries out the task. Only when the th first thread has released the lock by calling lock unlock will the first thread, will the second thread be able to access, will this, will the second thread um, be able to access this code because this, this lock.lock .lock will return on the second thread, enabling the second thread to carry out the task. So we can sort of lock blocks of code. First, first thread, this just returns. It executes the code. Second thread, <coughs> this blocks um, until the first thread has released the lock here. So those are the three methods for synchronization. Um, now, another aspect of data synchronization is what's known as atomic action. So, many things in programming take a single step, um, such as modifying a primitive variable, but other actions take several steps. So, plus plus i, you're kind of increasing i, and you're returning a value of i, and there's like at least two or three steps involved in that. Whereas an atomic action happens all at once without any internal steps. So, if you read and write most primitive variables, except long and double, it's just a single action, um, that changes the state of a primitive variable. Now, if primitive actions or atomic actions, um, sorry, atomic actions are typically thread safe. If I'm modifying a Boolean in one thread, um, then another thread will see the modified state once it's been changed. Whereas um, if you have non-atomic actions, then you can get this data inconsistency because one thread could be in the process of modifying it, and so the other thread won't necessarily see you know, the final state of the object, it might see an intermediate state of it. So in plus plus i, uh, if one thread's calling plus plus i, another thread might see a different, like an intermediate state of i, rather than the final state that returns after when this is complete. Now with atomic actions, they're not entirely safe because there might be some clever ca caching strategies that Java Virtual Machine uses to manage memory, 
and with, that might hide changes to the variable from other threads, particularly applicable to uh, the Boolean stop threads. So I showed you you could use the Boolean stop thread um, to control one thread from another thread, um, but it's probably worth uh, using this, vol this uh, volatile keyword on those Booleans to, just in case they're being hidden by the virtual machine. So wh what the volatile keyword does is it warns the virtual machine that a variable might be modified in multiple threads, so you just declare it as volatile int my int, you know, whatever. Just put this keyword before it, and then that ensures that all threads will see the same consistent state of that variable. So I said, if you're using a Boolean to control the, to exit the run method, you probably want to declare it as a volatile. So it'd be volatile Boolean uh, run thread equals false or something like that. Yeah. Now all these complex locking synchronization methods can have a problem with deadlock. So the idea of deadlock is that two threads are forever waiting for something that the other thread has. So let's suppose thread A has object A and is waiting for object B. And thread B, has object, thread B has object B and is waiting for object A. So these two threads, they both have something that they want, uh, the other thread wants, and they're kind of waiting for it. So, you know, maybe this will work, let's just think. So suppose one person has a hammer and another person has some nails. Now, the person with the hammer is waiting for the person with the nails to give them the nails so that the person, so person A has the hammer. Let's say John has the hammer, right? And he wants the nails from Alice. So he says, Alice, can I please have the nails so that I can like, bang some nails in this piece of wood? Now Alice uh, has the nails, and she sees that John has the hammer, so she says, please, John, can I have the hammer so that I can bang in some nails into my piece of wood? And so both John and Alice are waiting for something from each other, and neither of them can complete their task until they receive that thing, and so they're effectively just blocked, and they just sit there forever until they starve for death, and they'll never bang the nails into their bit of wood. I tried to get a simple example running, but I couldn't get it working for some reason, I need to think more carefully maybe, but it is something to watch out for in your projects, particularly if you've got, you know, synchronization mechanisms, or if you've got, and if you've got multiple threads and sockets and so on, this could easily happen. So most classes in Java can only be safely used within a single thread, um, so if multiple threads need to access a data structure, they need to use, you can either do your own synchronization with synchronized methods, or you can use synchronized collections they have these special collections in Java that are, you know, thread safe. Or you can even use synchronization wrappers that, that you wrap a, wrap a standard collection and returns a synchronized collection. Um, but I think you have to, you still have to use a synchronized block to iterate over the collection. Um, so, you know, whether this is, this extra complexity is anyway handy is a little bit of an open question, I think. Okay, so that's a little bit of a, Summary overview of how you use threads and how you use threads in Java and some of the issues that you might encounter with them. So now I'm just going to briefly talk through a multi-threaded TCP server that combines the power of threads and sockets together and shows you how you can handle multiple users, um, how you can connect to multiple users. And I'm going to adapt this a little bit it for an example of an online game in, in a couple of lectures. So a single threaded TCP server, you just sort of um, you know, opening socket, waiting for the connection, and then you've got a ba 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 ba. Yeah, accept. You've got this blocking connection. Sits there and waits. Once the connection happens, then it does some stuff and then exits. But I put together a multi-threaded server example. So there's a main main method that just launches everything, and then three thread classes: the connection listener, connection handler, and TCP client. So this enables you to do play multiple games with multiple clients and have multiple like pairwise matches between the clients. So this is roughly how it works. Here we have the sort of main method. And that launches this connection listener. Connection listener just opens this server socket and sits there waiting for a client to connect to it. Then we have a client that connects to it. And what it does is it passes that client off to a connection handler and the connection handler handles all the interactions with the client while this connection listener continues to listen for more connections. So the, so the blocking call and the connection listener can still function while there's lots of exchange happening between the, between the client and the, and the actual server. And then another TCP client connects, is passed to another connection handler, another connection TCP client connects and is passed to another connection handler. So in this way, we've got sort of three sets of simultaneous connections between this client and this server. They could be like doing stuff in the database, they could be doing all kinds of things. And 
you know, that'd be completely impossible or very difficult if we've got the blocking call on the server that's waiting for connections. And this connection listener is still sitting there happily waiting for more connections and could wait for if they could have a thousand connections or whatever this kind of architecture. So here's the, um, the main method. So starting the connection listener and starting three clients. These clients connect to the listener and send, um, I think they just send some messages. Yeah, they, these are the IDs of the clients. They each got a separate ID. And then we've got uh, the connection listener. So we have this uh, timeout here. So what this timeout does is it, uh, it sits there, blocking method, waiting for accept. And it'll wait there until the timeout expires, and then it'll throw this socket timeout exception. And then it'll go back up to here. Um, and then just keep, keep doing that, waiting for connection, having a timeout, throwing, throwing an exception, going back to here. So I've added the timeout um, to enable me to shut it down cleanly. So I've got this thread interrupted um, check here. So without that, this would just block indefinitely, and I have to just shut it down in a sort of kind of dirty manner. Whereas here, I can shut it down in a clean manner by, call, by interrupting the thread, and that'll cause the thread to exit nicely, and you know it's all, all very beautiful. So we've got the timeout, um, and then we accept the connection, um, assuming that the connection's been made, um, and then the handler create a new handler. And we pass the handler the socket, and it's the handler that actually does all the, all the inter interactions with the client, while at the same time as we're waiting for another connection. I mean, here we have the handler, and we just then the handler itself can have like an input stream, output stream to and from the, the client, and it can read messages from the client, and then it, echo, and it echoes them uh, to the user. And then it, also we can shut down the handler nice and And the handler itself a separate thread. And that's what we're doing here. We're starting up the handler as a separate thread to handle the interactions with the client. And here we have the client, just a simple, similar client to all the other ones I've shown you. It's itself a, um, a thread, and all it's doing is sending a message, um, sending a message to the, in this case, the connection handler, sleeping, sending another message. So I'll just show you to, to you now. And so this is our multi-threaded TCP server. So this starts all the other stuff. So starting up the five clients and the handlers receiving the messages from the clients and just echoing that onto the, onto the command line. So you can run this, um, run this at home um, and potentially adapt it for your projects. So all the example code for, for this lecture um, is available on the course website, so, so there's quite a lot of it, but it's all you know, useful, and if you want to understand how this works, um, I would strongly recommend you have a play with it. We're going to have some, some tutorials and run through some examples in the lab sessions as well. So further reading, there's a chapter on threads in Liang, which I, I recommend you have a look at. So this lecture, we talked about how you could use threads to process requests from multiple clients. Um, you may find this very useful in your online game. And next lecture, I'm going to talk about, well, the next three lectures are going to explain how you can build very simple online games. And that, that I hope, will be a useful starting point for your actual uh, second projects.